COVID series. Building on the first session, long COVID and health equity in the Commonwealth, what we know and what we don't know. Today, we will focus on policy interventions that can address the health equity implications of long COVID and actions government can take to support people living with long COVID. I want to first express my heartfelt appreciation to all of you for joining us, to our participants for their work and their expertise and sharing of their time, and to my colleagues who are co-sponsoring this event. They include Senator Joe Comerford, the chairs of the Joint Committee on Public Health, Representative Marjorie Decker and Senator Julian Sear, and the Massachusetts Black and Latino Legislative Caucus chaired by Representative Bud Williams. I think Representative Decker is here. She came on when in between some meetings. And if she is, I'd like to give her an opportunity to say a few words. Representative Decker, are you with us? I am, thank you, Mindy. Can you, all right, I think everyone can hear me. Yeah, um, listen, Mindy, I just wanna say, first of all, thank you for not allowing this issue to um, just disappear. There's a lot of people who are still struggling both with long-term COVID and um, the reality is, is that COVID um, is still really impacting people in ways that are um, really harming their health and also their sense of security, their sense of economic security, personal security and emotional security. And, um, you know, I know that we are all really anxious to kind of get back to a, like life pre-COVID, but there's no such thing. It, this is a new normal. And um, just to say that when I can and when I think it's um, I, I'm able to, I still mask up. And if and just to be clear, if, if I'm feeling sick at all, I think I've also learned nobody wants my cold, never mind COVID. Um, but I think that this issue of long-term COVID is really an important issue. And we know that there are people who are struggling. It is a new illness that needs to be better understood. And um, we in the legislature certainly use opportunities like these briefings that you're holding to continue to educate and inform ourselves about how do we ensure that we're making the best possible decisions in the legislature and in partnership with our medical community, our provider community, and with the, um, the governor and um, the Health and Human Services um, Administration. So really just to say, really thank you. You have been incredibly just strong and persistent. And um, we're at a time in which people really, you know, even get annoyed that we wanna continue talking about um, COVID and public health, but it's not done. And people continue to feel um, suffer in many different ways. So to all of you who are on here, I also want to say thank you to many of you. I know there's a lot of great speakers, but there's also a great, there's a lot of incredible listeners on this as well who are doing important work. And thank you for doing the work that you do. And I encourage you to continue to reaching out to all of us, both your reps, your senators, um, as well as chairs of committees that are in an opportunity to act on something, because the more you partner with us and inform us and educate us about what you're seeing on the ground, the better we're able to navigate what, um, what it looks like to make more choices that only help people um, both heal um, and to do the kind of important preventative work that is at the core of public health. So um, just to say thank you, I'm going to shut my screen off because I'm parked, but I'm headed to the State House and I'm going to keep listening. And I do see some familiar faces on there. I'm going to say hello to Jackie, who's on there. I don't know if you see me, Jackie. It's been way too I long. Do. But I do. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thank you All so right. much, thank Chair Decker. And thank you for jumping in. And really, thank you for your extraordinary leadership on this and all matters of public health. Very grateful for your work. I also want to take a moment to recognize and express my appreciation to my staff, Grace Simmons and Lily Stowe Alekman. Their organizing skills, compassion, and advocacy have helped to shape today's briefing, and I'm very grateful for their work. So many of you know, a few weeks ago, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine proposed a new universal definition for long COVID, an essential task to increase knowledge of the condition and facilitate its diagnosis and treatment. The National Academy proposed, and I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot about it this afternoon, that the long COVID definition should be, it is an infection related chronic condition that occurs after COVID-19 and remains present for at least three months as a continuing relapsing and remitting or progressive disease state 
that affects one or more organ systems. And most notably, the proposed universal definition did not and does not require laboratory confirmation and other proof of initial infection. This development is huge and reveals many possibilities for governmental and non-governmental action. Today, we'll hear a variety of policy solutions that can make life better for people experiencing long COVID and those that who love and care for them and support the capacity of their medical providers to treat their illness. We'll hear about proposals to build our shared knowledge about the incidence and experience of long COVID in our Commonwealth and in our country. Our speakers are experts in their fields and they bring their knowledge, experience and compassion to this work and for our benefit today. I'm going to give brief biographies now of our speakers so that when we start the presentations, it can just go from one person to the next seamlessly. In today's session, you'll hear from Nisha McRae, the executive director of Bagika, who will speak about the needs of patients experiencing long COVID. We'll also hear from Dr. Cheryl Clark, the executive director and senior vice president of the Institute for Health Equity Research, Evaluation and Policy, and associate chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine and Primary Care at Brigham and Women's Hospital, an associate professor at Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Clark will share policy priorities for providing effective and equitable clinical care and social supports to individuals with long COVID. Dr. Linda Sprague Martinez, professor in the Department of Medicine and director of the Health Disparities Institute at UConn Health, will discuss policy priorities for educating the public about long COVID. Michael Curry, President and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers will be discussing policy priorities for advancing health equity in the Commonwealth for long COVID. Two representatives from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences will share with us DPH's role and response. They will be Assistant Commissioner and Director Dawn Fukuda and the Bureau's Medical Director, Dr. Larry Madoff. Jackie Lindsay, a fierce advocate in the community from the Boston COVID Recovery Cohort and co-chair of the National Community Engagement Group of NIH's National Recover Research Initiative, will share six community-driven policies. And she will also close us off um, by highlighting the path forward and where we're headed on long COVID in the Commonwealth and in the country. Please note that this briefing is being recorded and it will be shared following the event. We will also share copies of the presentation and we'll ask you to complete an exceedingly brief survey following today's briefing. There will be a Q&A session following speaker's presentations. So please feel free to submit your question in the question and answer tab. My staff will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the presentations. Um, I would like to recognize, I think, Representative Bud Williams from the caucus would be here. Is Are you in the room, Rep. Williams? Okay, we'll get uh, back up. Oh. Rep. Williams is not on, uh, but I, I'm on, Zavon. Um, I'm the executive director of the Black and Latino Caucus, so Thank good you, to be Zavon. with you. Would, would you like to say a few words for the caucus? Sure, sure, happy to. Um, I think what I would mainly like to highlight is how important this gathering is. Um, long COVID is a, a crucial issue and has specifically been impactful um, on Black and Latino communities uh, in ways that I, I would say have highlighted some of the inequities in our healthcare system. Um, and so I'm just grateful for this space from folks who are speaking to folks who are listening. Um, I think this is an opportunity for us to gain invaluable insights uh, that will help us uh, deal with, you know, the current effects of long COVID, but also, you know, any diseases that may come in the future um, that, that you know, the world has to prepare for. Um, and I, on a personal note, um, if I can, I actually just want to share my screen. In, in my family, I had a, um, I had a, a family member, my dad, um, deal with uh, long COVID. I don't know if, if folks can see that image here, uh, but my dad, uh, right on the onset of COVID, uh, he was an essential worker working for Quest. So he was delivering the, the test uh, back and forth. Um, and so through that experience, he was exposed 
And my dad was always the healthiest guy I knew, you know, big, strong, works out a lot. If anyone wants to get in shape, they talk to him. And um, when he got hit with this, he ended up in, in the hospital for seven weeks, mm -hmm. on and off the ventilator twice. Um, it led to multiple issues with organs and whatnot. And I was, and we were lucky enough that my dad actually ended up surviving. And what I have here is an image of him and just a text message that kind of highlights just how uh, impactful COVID can be in, in, in our personal lives. Um, but even though he, you know, he managed to make it and he's doing much better, he's feeling much better. Uh, he still has to deal with some of those effects, you know, the impact that the disease had on on his other organs like kidneys and and lungs and, and whatnot. Um, uh, so I'm grateful, you know, as the executive director that this conversation has happened, but certainly grateful as someone whose family and friends have, have dealt with COVID uh, acutely and uh, uh, over time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zavon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sharing your personal story with us. And also thank you for the caucuses partnership and on this issue and on so many incredible issues in the state house and your leadership on health equity. So appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, so we are going to kick off our conversation today with Nisha McRae, who will speak to us about patient needs and experiences. Welcome Nisha. Thank you so much, Representative Dom, and to everyone joining us on this call. My name is Nisha McCray, and I'm here to share a little bit about what is the patient's perspective in regards to their needs post COVID-19 infection or when they're dealing with long COVID. And so next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization called Bajika, and the long short of it is, I'm an executive director of a STEM nonprofit, so I sit at the crossroads of all these major industries and players, and I get to see the perspective of what the long shadow of the COVID-19 pandemic has created in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, because we work with private industry players, we work with government, we work with the educational space, so we deal with educators who are dealing with this not only in their own personal lives, but in the classroom, and we're also, as a nonprofit, involved in the community. So we are also getting feedback from our community members, some of them who look to us as a STEM nonprofit and go, you're the closest thing to a science or an engineering competent person, could you demystify or clarify or explain to me what is going on with me or my loved one or to a family member or a friend? And so despite our organization in 2019 into 2020 being focused on teaching people the key concepts and principles of science and engineering, we now have had to take on this social worker role and helping people navigate not only the pandemic, but the long shadow of it, which is now in the form of PASC or long COVID. Next slide. So I like to go back to one of my favorite pieces of data because I am a data nerd, and it is the US Census Household Survey to set the stage for the space we're creating today. The latest one that I'm gonna talk about, there's a couple of ones, but this one in particular I wanna highlight, gives you kind of a feel of what is happening in regards to those suffering from long COVID and what needs they currently have and will have in the near future as we try to figure out what can we do for this community. So let's take this US Census household survey to May, 2023. Next slide. At the time, one in two Americans or adults, because the survey doesn't survey children, had reported a previous COVID-19 infection. It's easy to assume given the subsequent waves since May 2023 that this number is quite significantly higher, but let's stick to May 2023 right now. Next slide. At that time, one in 10 US adults was reporting that they were suffering with something they didn't know exactly what long COVID was due to the lack of education for the majority of Americans at this time, but they knew something wasn't right with them physically or mentally post COVID-19 infection. And it wasn't right three or more months after their known COVID-19 infection. Next slide. Four in five of those individuals who reported suffering from shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction, like not remembering where your keys were, where you live, or not being able to complete the daily tasks required for you at your job or in your personal life, 
they started reporting that these were starting to limit their daily activities or ability to function in their homes, at work, at school, or in society overall. Next slide, please. Out of those individuals, one in four stated that their symptoms were so severe that they had to do significant activity limitations. And to give you context what significant means, it means, for example, that if you were able to go to work from nine to five, you would not be able to do any other activity after work. That means not helping your kids with their homework, not engaging with social activities, not being able to complete household chores, or worse. So to set the stage of what we mean by significant activity limitations by this population. Next slide. And so that's where I want to focus my time with you all today. A lot of times when we talk about long COVID, we focus on if individuals are hospitalized or not. Do individuals have to have post-acute care due to their COVID-19 infection? What is the outlook medically? But the thing we keep hearing from long COVID patients is the socioeconomic status being threatened is their number one concern when it comes to long COVID. In particular, these three areas, occupation, education, and income. And that is because if these areas are not stable for the long COVID patient or their family, that causes more stress or limits their ability to pursue healthcare or to treat the long go ongoing symptoms they have post COVID. Next slide, please. At the time, Brookings Metro is still standing by this number of 12.2 working age Americans with long COVID who were in the labor force pre-COVID are no longer in the labor force. And at least a million are estimated to be in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at this time. Next slide, please. That is about 15% of the labor shortage that we are experiencing here in the Commonwealth that could possibly be explained that there are adults who were in the labor force who are not able to because of long COVID. Next slide. Because of this, we need to take a step back and think how many Americans, let alone residents of the Commonwealth, are able to afford to not participate in the labor force when we're dealing with a population that most Americans have less than $1,000 in their savings account for any type of emergency. And if you lived in this area for any length of time, a thousand dollar emergency is a generous emergency. That is not having to take one month off from work, missing a car payment, having to pay a health insurance premium, or even groceries for the majority of individuals in the Commonwealth. Next slide, please. What is now being considered by the Social Security Administration as well as long COVID and patient advocacy groups is that the functional limitation that comes with long COVID, as you heard from Representative Dom, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics has come out with their long COVID definition. And there's relapsing and remitting symptoms, meaning that long COVID patients are almost getting a double whammy versus other ailments. With cancer, you're able to understand that when you're undergoing treatment or things of that nature, there's a period of time that you're not going to be able to work. With long COVID, you're not only having the functional limitations that come with the symptoms, but you don't know when you're going to be able to do X, Y, and Z for your job or your home or personal life. And because of the functional limitation and how unpredictable these symptoms can be, the impact to day-to-day -day life is highly associated or is associated with a higher prevalence of housing insecurity. And given the state or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and housing insecurity status already, this is probably one of the greatest threats and fears we hear from patients day in and day out over the last four years. Next slide, please. We noticed that the average cost, and this should be no shock to anyone here, of a two bedroom apartment in Boston is about $3,000. I can tell you as someone who teaches high school students now looking for housing in the city of Boston, that's a very generous number for some of my students who will snag at that deal. Next slide. 
if you have four and five individuals who are dealing with long COVID, who are already reporting activity limitations, then you have someone who's not able to earn enough income or have stability when it comes to food, shelter, and security. And this is where I would like for you all to focus your attention as you hear about all the policies as well as medical definitions and advancement associated with long COVID. Next slide. What we know right now, and again, data is behind what is actually happening on the ground. We are already seeing those with long COVID experiencing double the difficulty of anyone else or population when it comes to housing payments. Next slide, please. We're also seeing them twice as likely, likely to face eviction or foreclosure. Next slide, please. And so let me wrap this around to the context of why I'm here sharing this with you all today. This image is of me post COVID-19, still on the up and up recovering from long COVID, teaching the American public in the city of Boston outside of a school and bonus points if you can recognize what school it is, <laughs> Madison Park, for those who are not from the city of Boston, I gotta give a freebie to some people, showcasing how the city of Boston is a mecca for innovation to Boston public school students. This picture would not have been possible if it wasn't for the enormous safety net and privilege that I experience. Even though I am a woman of color, I have a degree from MIT. I have a mother and a father who were in healthcare to help me navigate treatments and medical providers in order to make sure that I was getting the best possible treatments <sighs> available today. I also have a husband who was able to make sure that if I wasn't able to work, we were not in danger of eviction or foreclosure or that we were going to be homeless on the street. All of those individuals allowed for me to have a safety net in order to navigate long COVID. However, in my long COVID support groups or those community members I talked to, there was no one who can provide that for them and right now what they need is stability. Next slide, please. That picture took approximately 30 months to get to for me to even have a diagnosis of long COVID. And not only did I have to wait that long period of time, 24 of those months I was unable to work. That is two years of no income that I was able to gain to maintain my housing, my bills, and just because you can't reach a medical provider doesn't mean your, your health insurance payments aren't due, or as my mother likes to say, because she's from the South, the bill man still expects his bills to be paid. Next slide, please. This number is out of date, but I have to wait for a couple of medical bills to come through because you know there's a delay, but I'm standing at almost half a million dollars to date in terms of my long COVID symptom diagnosis, management, and care. I think we can all take a step back and realize how many individuals will be able to afford this level of a safety net in the Commonwealth. How many of your constituents, how many of, like, we're not even gonna talk about constituents, your family members, your friends, or even you can afford for someone to deal with this level of debt. Next slide, please. So the past couple of years, I've been telling people, I went from, a bed bound long COVID patient to a long COVID patient who is able to advocate for others, including caregivers and families and communities who have not been able to have spaces like this to showcase what we are suffering with and what we are trying to cope and deal with. But every time I speak, everyone asks me, what can you do? What can she do in order to overcome these obstacles? And I think maybe it's due to my nonprofit work but it's not a question of what one individual can do. Next slide, please. I'm doing my part by trying to advocate and speaking to my experiences when I'm going through severe long COVID symptoms to what I'm going through now with moderate long COVID symptoms and how the relapsing and remitting of symptoms has caused chaos in my own personal life and my inability to support my community. But it's not all on me or on patients who have long COVID or their family members to address the needs we have associated with this infection. Everybody, including yourselves, was touched by the pandemic. Next slide, please.
So instead of asking what can the long COVID patient do or their family member or caregiver do, I want you to do the following. Next slide, please. I want you to think about what parts of the socioeconomic status can you bring stability to for long COVID patient family members or their caregivers at least if you can't do for the patients. Next slide. And that part, I think everyone on this call is more than capable to figure out a solution that can not just be in the idea cloud, but can actually be implemented to provide some stability for these patients. Because the need right now is to bring calm to the chaos that the COVID-19 pandemic brought to us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you so much. Um, your presentations are always illuminating and powerful um, on many levels, and I so appreciate you. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from another person who we all appreciate. She is a fierce advocate, um, not only for those of us in the Commonwealth, but for across the country on the issue of long COVID, making sure that government steps up and does its part um, in addition to all the other sectors. I, it's, it's my honor to introduce Jackie Lindsay, who will start us off. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you so much, Rip Dom. Um, I want to say everything that Nisha just said leads right into um, the brief framing that I want to do before we hear from Dr. Clark and, and Linda Sprague Martinez. And that is the Boston COVID a recovery cohort, which is focused on addressing long COVID and advancing health equity, ha has been holding community education forums to let our community know about what's happening and especially to let them know about what's happening related to the top priorities for this work that our community has set. As a result of those forums, we heard the community identify six policy priorities for systems change to address long COVID and advance health equity in Massachusetts. Next slide, please. Quickly, um, those six priorities are the following. One, develop a shared definition of long COVID. Two, invest in a quantitative data infrastructure, because right now we don't have one. Three, invest in qualitative data and stories so that we can hear the kinds of things we just heard from Nisha. Because if it's all about the numbers and not about the people, we're not just missing a huge part of the story, we're missing a huge part of the solution. Four, invest in clinical care and social support informed by the data and the stories that we collect. Five, invest in educating the public and primary care providers because we discovered so much of the public is unaware about what long COVID is, that they have it, that their family members have it. They may be dragging along, but they don't know what they have. And the other big finding was throughout this, people were going to their primary care providers and the primary care providers were unaware of long COVID. So those are two critical audiences we need to educate. And the sixth priority, invest in a community building infrastructure. And that means what it's gonna take to achieve those other priorities is really working with the community as a partner a true partner in supporting achievement of those priorities. So that's the overview. Next slide. Um, very quickly, a shared definition of long COVID is to inform efforts to address it, including we need though that shared definition will inform continued research, clinical care and social support, public and community education and engagement, and advocacy for policy and institutional change. Next slide, please. Investing in a quantitative data infrastructure, and this is really about supporting statewide data collection 
coordination across systems, monitoring, and a biggie, learning about long COVID and health equity. We need to support collaboration among public, private, and community-based health systems. We need to collect and coordinate information across these systems. And we need to use this data to monitor how long COVID is evolving, because it's been evolving while we, we're not paying attention. And we need to identify whom it impacts and how across the diverse demographic and geographic communities of our state, and I could add our country. Next slide. Invest in a quantitative data infrastructure to do ongoing performance review, to understand what testing, mitigation strategies, and equity approaches are working or not working, and for whom. And also um, to understand where and, and what improvement is needed and how to strengthen the healthcare and health of our diverse communities. And you can hear in this commitment, the same kind of commitment we heard from the executive director of the Black and Latinx Caucus, this, you cannot address long COVID effectively without advancing health equity. Next slide, please. Three, invest in capturing qualitative data and stories from diverse patients and families living with long COVID, I think, Nisha spoke powerfully to that. Next slide, please. Once we gather effective data, both quantitative and qualitative, we need to invest in an infrastructure to provide effective and equitable clinical care and social support. And you'll notice not just clinical care, but social support. Next slide, please. The last two things we mentioned earlier, invest in educating the public and primary care providers, and most importantly, at the very end, to help achieve the other five goals, invest in a community building infrastructure to help achieve these policy priorities for systems change. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I believe next on our list is Dr. Linda Sprague Martinez to talk with us about priorities for educating the public. Dr. Sprague Martinez. Great. Actually, I believe it's Cheryl is next. Cheryl. Oh, sorry. My yeah, my Cheryl list, Clark. I, yeah. I, forgive me, Dr. Clark. You're you're up next to talk with us about primary care and social supports to address the social determinants of health and long COVID, and my apologies, thank you. No, no thank you so much. I wanna thank you, uh, Representative Don, for creating this space, and also wanna share and thank uh, the legislature uh, and staff and all the uh, folks who were able to come together today to provide this information and to really give a 360 uh, degree view on this critical issue. And on the next slide, I just wanted to mention that I um, am going to be speaking about this topic of clinical care and social support, but you'll see that these issues are all interconnected and interwoven. And so you'll hear multiple themes that really do echo across all of our topic areas. And on the next slide, um, I wanted to mention that I don't have any uh, disclosures to declare. I'm also coming to you as an investigator uh, and collaborator on the NIH uh, Recover uh, study uh, that is uh, also hosted in Boston. That was an opportunity for several uh, academic and community uh, centers to come together to think about uh, how do we understand what long COVID is. And on the next slide, I also wanted to uh, really appreciate the Boston Recovers Community Partnership Table. Both uh, Nisha uh, McRae and Jackie Lindsay spoke about the critical importance of understanding this, both from the perspective of uh, people who have had long COVID, but also the communities in which uh, we all live. And so part of what uh, we want to make sure that we make clear today is that there are several priorities across research and getting better treatments in place, what we do around community education that Linda Sprague-Martinez will talk about institutional and policy changes that are needed. And I'm gonna speak specifically about this issue of clinical care and social support on the next slide. 
I'm going to start by giving an update to our January briefing, where we gave a different definition of long COVID, and you'll hear this uh, multiple times because it is very important. There are several new features of the definition that came out a couple of weeks ago from uh, NASM. And I'm going to talk about it from a clinical perspective and sort of highlight the things that are important in that way. So long COVID, LC, um, it's an infection associated chronic condition, right? So it's uh, something that uh, lasts the after the initial uh, coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 infection, and it's present for at least three months as a continuous relapsing, remitting, progressive disease state that affects one or more organs. And what's important and what's changed since the last time that we looked at our definition in January is the timing is important. Uh, when we spoke last time, we often thought of long COVID as uh, being able to be diagnosed a month or so after the initial infection. And I think now there's an understanding that the symptoms might be delayed in that fashion, but they also might be continuous so that you might be experiencing of symptoms that came up during your first COVID infection and that those can continue. Very important to also understand that this could be one organ, but quite often long COVID is multi-system, so affecting multiple parts of the body. It can give you new conditions or it can worsen existing conditions that you may have like diabetes or other conditions. What do we mean when we say uh, progression? You can, uh, become better. Uh, it can relapse. Uh, so that sort of relapsing, remitting, it can be continuous or it can go away. So it can get better or worsen. That's an important part of this. And what is also very powerful about the new definition is that uh, NASM has recognized that it can happen at any time. Um, it can be sort of severe or life-threatening, even months or years after the infection, but that it has a social component that it can affect your ability to work and perform your self-care. Nisha McRae talked about that very powerfully. And it's really, um, I think, an advance that this has been recognized as well um, in the scientific definition of long COVID. So understanding both the biological as well as the social impacts as a part of the clinical definition. Let's go to the next slide. So let's also break down. The last time that we uh, had this conversation, we talked about the multiple systems um, that could be involved, the neurological symptoms that people have, the uh, kidney disease, cardiac heart disease. And so if you are thinking about a condition that is chronic, uh, that's long lasting, right? That affects multiple systems of the body. There are clinical implications for that. You do need a um, clinician or a set of uh, caregivers uh, and care providers who can follow you over the long term, longitudinal care. You may also need multiple clinicians to provide input and advice on what you're experiencing. And even if that is necessary, importantly, you also need someone to coordinate that so that your care becomes integrated particularly if you're experiencing conditions that you might have already had, um, but that have gotten worsened or that have changed in some ways. And so this definition really points out clinically the importance of longitudinal, multidisciplinary, coordinated care, and it has policy implications. And we'll talk about those on the next slide. I wanted to make sure that we also have a sense of this chronic, multi-system condition and its social implications. I really like this uh, sort of graphic that came out uh, in June, 2024, that uh, gives us a sense of how the social environment in which we lived, the socioeconomic conditions that Nisha McRae mentioned, both influence our health status before we got COVID or even long COVID. It may influence the ways that we're able to access care in the management of long COVID. And it certainly has implications for how we're able to take time if we have fatigue and exhaustion that's exacerbated or worsened by activity. And it also, I think that we heard really powerfully uh, Zavon Billups talk about the psychological impact both for the people who uh, suffered uh, through COVID and its long-term effects and the families who have to do that. So as we think about uh, long COVID, we have to think about it in its broader 
social, economic, and social determinants of health context, even in terms of its structural context, structural racism and discrimination, understanding its social and community context. For example, are we able to uh, perform our self-care, but also perform the kinds of economic activities that help us to make sure that our food is secure, our housing is secure. All of these uh, contexts are important to consider as we think about the policy priorities. And I'm gonna name two. So we're gonna go to the next slide. The first priority from a clinical perspective that helps us to think about both this sort of need for longitudinal care that may be multidisciplinary, but that coordinates that is primary care. Investing in primary care access in Massachusetts is critical to uh, address long COVID and equity in long COVID. And there are three points I'd like you cons to consider um, with respect to primary care access and investment. Geographic access, demographic disparities. And throughout the presentations today, you'll also hear about the importance of making sure that care is affordable and how important community health centers are in addressing that piece. To start uh, around geographic access, I thought it was important just to remind us all uh, that we think of Massachusetts as having a really strong uh, infrastructure for care. And we have some of the uh, most um, uh, celebrated, I would say, infrastructure and organizations in the country um, that provide care. And yet, if you look at a map of Massachusetts, you'll see that the majority of the state actually, in many ways, has health professional shortage areas in primary care. And you see that's particularly important in Western Massachusetts. I was um, also surprised as I was sort of looking at the information and data for this presentation that a lot of this conversation um, would ha uh, even happened in 2010, uh, around the time that the Affordable Care Act was passed, that we were looking at some of the same maps and having the same conversations. And it really, I think, is an important uh, point because the urgency uh, with which we uh, need to address making sure that everyone can have access to a primary uh, clinician to help uh, care for them, both uh, for their chronic conditions and certainly for long COVID, is uh, perhaps not new, but is gaining urgency as we are uh, understanding this issue. And on the next slide, I am really excited by uh, the data from CHIA uh, that, uh, and the, also the MHA uh, uh, quality partners, the Massachusetts uh, quality partners have gotten together to look at this from an equity perspective and how it matters. And one thing that you'll be able to see is that there are relationships between the populations, Black and non-Hispanic populations, as well as populations that identify as being uh, Latine. If you have or don't have a usual source of care, you often do um, have an increased likelihood of having to get even avoidable um, sort of primary care sensitive conditions that land you in the emergency department or uh, that don't allow you to get the primary care visits that you need for your preventive care. And not being able to get this fundamental care also uh, makes it a lot more difficult for you to treat underlying conditions that are worsened by long COVID. And so this priority to improve uh, primary care access also matters for equity. We'll go to the next slide and we'll talk about the second priority I'd like to share today. In addition to increasing and improving access to primary care, we also need to make sure that that primary care workforce is diverse in a couple of ways, both by roles in terms of community health workers, and we'll talk about that, in terms of the kind of primary care that can be provided, for example, the mental health workforce, as well as making sure that we make sure that all people who have um, experiences from all walks of life are able to provide care so that we all have a chance to meet people who we can relate to and who can relate to us. And on the next slide, um, I'll talk about community health workers in particular, and many community health centers have community health workers uh, on their staff and how important um, CHWs or community health workers are for uh, addressing social determinants of health. 
I wanted to mention that uh, 787,000 referrals have been made during the pandemic to social services and healthcare services, and 16.9 million people uh, have been educated by CHWs. This important work has also been invested in by the CDC, $340 million. And we have uh, been able in Massachusetts to uh, have several communities, and you'll see them at the bottom of the slide, that have been able to um, uh, take advantage of this work. And so CHWs are an important part of our diverse workforce to invest in. Uh, we'll go quickly, we'll go to the next slide. The second recommendation related to mental health, we heard on the call how important uh, that it is and how uh, deeply, not only physically, but emotionally, uh, what we've been through has happened. And I wanted to point you to uh, a recent report that came out in Boston that 43% of young people have persistent sadness in high school. And so one of the investments to watch is what happens um, as the, um, for example, in the city of Boston, as we try to tackle some of these issues, particularly for our youth um, and use ARPA dollars to invest in school supports, training and behavioral health uh, clinicians, there may be successful strategies that can be used and scaled across the state. And then I'll make a final point before summarizing on the next slide really important um, to also make sure that we are making the investments that are needed to uh, diversify our workforce. And I think one of the most important, um, or at least uh, a visible way of doing this is making sure that we incentivize primary care entry through loan repayment. And uh, Massachusetts, uh, the MA Repay, as it's called, has been a contributor to that for both behavioral health and primary care, continuous skilled nursing, mental health and then health and human services uh, work. So I will summarize on the last slide that there are, uh, there's a new definition that has both clinical and social implications and that our priorities from a clinical perspective are twofold, making sure that primary care access and sustainability and workforce diversity are improved. And to make that happen, there are interventions that we should watch for healthcare, community health worker uh, investments, mental health training uh, for professionals, particularly for child mental health, and then making sure that we invest in diverse workforce, um, loan repayment being one of those investments. Thank you uh, for your attention and I'll turn it over uh, to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. You've given us um, the start of a very great to-do list. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Linda Sprague-Martinez, I believe now it is the right time, around policy priorities for educating the public about long COVID. Welcome. Thank you so much, Representative Dom, um, and to the legislator, legislature for taking the time today. Um, I'm Linda Sprague-Martinez, and I'm going to be um, speaking specifically about some policy recommendations. And um, although I'm coming to you today by way of Connecticut, the work that I'll report on um, and, and that I'm drawing from is work that I conducted here as um, when I was at Boston University. And I'm also coming to you as a resident of Boston um, and a member of the NASM committee that put together the consensus report. So you can click to the next slide. Um, so going back to the definitions that Jackie shared with us earlier, or the or the priority areas that she shared with us earlier that came out of the recover table work. Um, I'm going to revisit those and think about well, what could we actually do in terms of operationalizing them in in policy. The first one um, is easy, right? It was develop a shared definition of long COVID. It wasn't so easy developing that definition. It took quite some time, but the good news is back on June 11th. Um, which was just last week or the week before, NASM did release a definition. So now we have that. We have a shared definition of long COVID, and that was has been one of our greatest barriers in terms of getting information out to the public is not having a shared definition. So the first thing that we can think about doing here in Massachusetts is adopting the proposed definition um, and really including the framing around equity. The one thing in the NASM report that is, is very important in addition to the points that Dr. Clark just um, brought us through it is 
is the idea that that we need to be thinking about equity in the case of long COVID. And in Massachusetts, that's real. When we think about who was disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, there's no reason for us not to assume that those same populations could be disproportionately impacted by long COVID. And so we want to adopt a definition and we want to do that in the context of equity framing. Um, and then we need to develop and distribute that definition, as well as the guidelines for ensuring long COVID equity, um, as well as guidelines for ensuring long COVID equity to professional organizations, healthcare delivery organizations across our state. Um, and so that means in doing so, we need to establish clear definitions for achieving equity. And you can click to the next slide where I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so the second point that Jackie talked about was investing in educating the public um, plus primary care providers about long COVID and advancing health equity. In order to do that, um, we can't just do it in a silo. As we heard from Dr. Clark, there are multiple groups that are involved in, in addressing long COVID. It's not just a clinical definition, it's their social impacts. We need to establish a shared leadership long COVID communications working group um, that is intergovernmental, cross-sector and community led. So that's um, thinking of bringing people together from across sectors, from across government divisions and departments, along with community members, community leaders, to think about what our communication campaign needs to look like for long COVID. Um, we need to develop a state web page for long COVID, which I, I believe is, is already, there's been conversation about. And then we need to launch a multilingual educational campaign to share and promote the definition, as well as information about long COVID to the public and providers. When we did our focus groups with 99 residents across the state in, in three different languages, um, four different languages, um, two years ago, we learned that people were describing symptoms of, of long COVID, had long COVID, but didn't necessarily have a long COVID diagnosis and were not at all. In, in nine of 11 focus groups, people had not heard about the, di the diagnosis of long COVID at that time. Um, but they were describing the symptoms. They were describing impacts on their social life and they were describing impacts on, on their health and well being and on their families. And so we need to get the information out there. We can't just do it in, in English, we need to do it in multiple languages um, across our state. And then we need to evaluate and monitor the campaign. We, 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 Jackie talked about data, Cheryl talked about data. We need to be collecting data as we go so that we can hold ourselves accountable to how we're doing, who's accessing the data, where are they going for information. We can look at data on the back end, but then we can engage in conversations with people about their experiences as they access the information um, and their understanding of it. Um, you can click to the next slide. We need to invest in infrastructure to provide effect, effective and equitable clinical care and social supports. So that was a, another area that Jackie talked about and Cheryl touched upon this quite a bit as well. Um, I would also encourage us to pass legislation that guarantees all Massachusetts residents have paid time off. A barrier to that we saw during COVID as well as for long COVID was at being able to leave work to seek care. Long COVID care, as we heard from Nisha, is not just one appointment. It is multiple appointments with multiple specialists. If we don't have paid time off, it makes it really hard to do that. Um, residents need paid time off, um, depend not and, and the type of work they have shouldn't dictate whether or not they have time off. We need to develop and disseminate guidelines for supporting Massachusetts residents with long COVID um, with specific, specific messages um, directed to employers. Employers need to understand long COVID. Our unions need to understand long COVID, what it is, how it could be impacting workers. School districts need to understand long COVID because children can also have long COVID. We need to have systems in place so that we're thinking about whether it's a 504 plan, whether it's an IEP. If long COVID is interfering with education progress, then we need to set up services for young people. And if our school districts are not aware of long COVID, then we can't do that. Health professionals need information about long COVID, all health professionals, not just primary care providers, um, not just physicians, although they are the first line of entry um, for many residents in our state, 
other professionals such as social workers, um, whether it's through the Association of Social Workers, they also need information about long COVID. Um, we need to be thinking about interdis interdisciplinary healthcare team broadly um, and, and thinking how we get them all information about long COVID. We need to start having conversations with insurers about long COVID, as well as other uh, relevant state offices. Um, there are some great information that's coming out. Um, Anisha mentioned the um, NASM report on long COVID and social security. There have been guidelines out for health professionals. These are things that we can adopt. Um, we're not going to have to reinvent the wheel entirely. So um, we also want to establish a mechanism for reporting barriers to treatment and supportive services. We heard from a lot of residents who are experiencing long COVID that they were being dismissed by their primary care providers. There's no reason why we should assume that health care inequities that already exist um, are not going to exist in the case of long COVID. We need a way for residents who are experiencing barriers to care um, that are uh, associated with interpersonal aspects of care or health systems barriers to be able to report that so that we can monitor it and address it. If I, a long time ago, when I worked for the Office of Minority Health, I learned very early, I was told, no data, no problem, right? We have a problem. We know that it's there. We need to be systematically collect, collecting data so that we can assess our progress towards, towards goals of, of addressing it. Um, we need to monitor and evaluate all of our activities. We need to assess racial and ethnic as well as geographic variation in access to treatment and supportive services for long COVID. We have pronounced um, inequities in, in geography across our state. So you can click to the next slide. Um, and then again, um, the investing in data infrastructure, not just the quantitative, there's a need for qualitative data as well as quantitative so that we can have a nuanced understanding of how long COVID is impacting our community and how we're doing in terms of, of addressing it. Um, the data systems need to be integrated, both the qualitative and the quantitative, and we need to ensure that the data collection, the data collection um, systems of, allow for opportunities for patients who are experiencing long COVID to share their stories. So, click to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much for that inspiring to-do list. I'm taking notes and making my to-do to list, which is going to be quite long and wonderful at the end of um, today's presentation. Thank you. Um, next, we'll be hearing from Michael Curry, the president and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, on policy priorities for advancing health equity in our state. Michael Curry, will you please join us? Thank you. Thank you. Absolute pleasure to be with you today. Uh, interestingly enough, if you see this background, I am sitting in the Boston Public Library, uh, just having done an interview with Jim Marjorie Egan. Uh, so we're gracious to give me some space to uh, join you here from the library. Uh, I was thinking about today's conversation and the, the urgency of this uh, work around long COVID, and it, it made me reflect back on uh, the height of the pandemic. Uh, as most of you, if not all of you on the call know, um, I'm the president and CEO of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers, uh, an over half century organization representing an over half century uh, collection of community health centers born out of civil rights to do exactly what we do now, right? Which is to respond to uh, uh, systemic racism in healthcare, to make sure that there's equitable access to quality healthcare, uh, regardless of ability to pay. Uh, from South Boston to Hilltown to North Shore to South Shore to uh, every nook and cranny of Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, South Boston, name it, uh, health centers are present in providing that care. Um, I was thinking about reflecting back on getting a call in two, 2020 from the Massachusetts legislature saying, Michael, uh, we'd like you to be on a task force that we're pulling together on COVID, and we'd like you to respond to um, this task force, be a part of it. And then um, within a few days, I was asked to co-chair it along with Dr. Seau from the Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, so for a better part of a year and a half, within the, the craziness of COVID, Dr. Seau and I were convening about 16, 17 leaders from across the state, uh, elected officials, uh, some of whom may be on the call, uh, and uh, lay people and uh, clinicians from across the state, all talking about how to respond to the moment. Uh, and particularly both uh, how to get vaccines in arms, how to get masks out, how to make sure that we're dealing with the underlying health disparities and the conditions that made people sick in the first place. Dr. Clark knows I'm a historian. 
what made black and brown folks, particularly I'll say African-Americans, most susceptible to the Spanish flu were the same things that made us more susceptible to COVID. Um, and now, in this moment, we put it together a report called The Blueprint for Health Equity. Here's why I bring it up today in this conversation. I was reflecting back on the report and the members and all the findings. And, and for those who've not done so, please make it a point. Because uh, as one of my professors say, we always try to repackage the Tylenol. Um, much of what we talk about has been talked about before, has been documented before. The roadmap has been laid. Uh, but we were able to create a report that I think you can find on the Massachusetts legislative website. It's called the Blueprint for Health Equity, Health Equity Task Force Final Report, July 1st, 2021. And I was looking back at one section of the report. It says, fund research on the intermediate and long-term effects of COVID-19. I want you to take that in for a second. As Jackie notes, we were already talking about the potential for the long-term effects of COVID-19 in 2020, early in the pandemic. The recommendation says the task force recommends that the legislature and administration collaborate to fund plans for research and monitoring of the intermediate and long-term effects of COVID-19. This research should be conducted on the health effects, including long-haul long health, behavioral health effects, the socioeconomic implications of the pandemic, and ongoing response and recovery needs. Federal funding should be sought for this purpose as well. So we know that the work that Jackie and so many other on this call have done to really lift up the importance of long COVID and make sure we're addressing it. But we should have known. And again, the past is prologue. It's no surprise that there are long-term effects of this pandemic. Um, and we should have been prepared to say, okay, in the immediacy of the crisis, what are we doing to make sure there's, there's care, there's access quality, that things are affordable, but how are we now positioning in this emergency preparedness, the long-term implications of a disease of this type uh, as we know that the disease is now endemic. So long COVID is not just those span of years. There's no folks on this call know better than me, but as just today's news is that there's a new variant that uh, was really leading the news this morning. What are the implications of that variant and other uh, variants of, of COVID on populations? Um, I'm here to, to provide some perspective and I have a short time to do that. I would say one is, as I listened to today's discussion, which I was able to join for part of it, I'm, I'm I'm really drawn to this this um, situation, which is much of what we've heard today, and you've heard already, is within the the master conversation around health inequity and health disparities broadly. So when I teach courses, and I teach a health policy course at Suffolk University, and then I teach a law school class, which I make a lot about racial inequity, I try to overwhelm my students with disparities in the first two days. I want them burnt out by disparities because I think each of us episodically, like some of you are long COVID specialists, right? But let me bring on a prostate cancer, colon cancer, maternal health. Let me bring on a sickle cell, a lupus, a mental health, right? Crisis, oral health, if you're Dr. Maisha Mentor Jordan. This is overwhelming for us. And then much of what you talk about in the strategy for long COVID is part of the strategies for all those other diseases. How do we make sure we build in health equity leadership into the government? So that, um, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Clark and others have heard me say this, if women ran everything, we wouldn't have a maternal health crisis in this country. And, and I don't say that for laughs or claps. I say that because the reality is you would prioritize women's health and you would, you would prioritize maternal health in a way that men would not do. So one is making sure people with lived experience are in these key places to then make great, solid, timely policy priorities that will make sure that responding to this crisis of disease, and in this case, long COVID. I am very fortunate. The other thing that came out of that task force that I let off with was about maybe a month after we published the report, I got a call from Jeffrey Sanchez, former House Ways and Means Chair. And he said, you notice stuff, and I'm keeping it clean for this call, is gonna sit on a shelf and uh, folks will not act on it. And we will still lose lives to all these disparities. He said, um, why don't we call the who's who of Boston's medical legal, I mean, Boston's uh, healthcare community and health community. And we did. He, he called many of them because he knew them from his years in ways and means. He made the call and they were all good hearted, good natured, committed people. But they said, OK, call us back when you bake the strategy. Call us back when you get something off the ground. And then we looked around and realized that there are phenomenal black and brown leaders like a Dr. Clark in her work in research or a Kane Hayes at Point 32, or formerly Manny Lopes was at Blue Cross Blue Shield, or Juan LaPera 
at B.I. Leahy, go down the list, Rosa Colon Colaco, then at Tufts Medical, um, Ro um, Amisha at CareQuest, uh, Kevin Churchwell at Children's. We've never seen a moment in Massachusetts where you've had leaders of color running systems, running systems, health centers, hospitals, uh, life sciences, life science uh, organizations. And we said, you know, lived experience matters. Let's call them first. Let's call them next, I should say. And when we call them, um, State Representative Dom, they did something that doesn't happen all the time. They didn't check with their legal departments, right? They didn't call their public relations teams. They said yes first. Now, I'm going to tell you, I worked at Blue Cross for 16 years. That's not how it usually happens. When somebody asks you to get involved, they usually go through all this bureaucracy to say, okay, what is it going to lead to? How much will it cost? What will it require? Will it conflict with some of our policy priorities? That didn't happen. So here's what we have. This group came together. It's now 82 leaders of color. Dr. Clark uh, is among that group. We presented an omnibus bill around health equity, which I think, Jackie, we really need to fold in this long COVID conversation as we close out this two-year session and tee up next year's two-year session into the broader health equity campaign and some of the work that includes, I'll just quickly reference, Massachusetts leads on many aspects of health care. There's still a lot we need to do to improve access and quality of care. Health insurance coverage is critical for individuals to be able to access care when they need it and, and not to defer care. As all of you know, people are having to make that choice. So this bill would extend full mass health coverage to all who are eligible, including children, regardless of immigration status. Where does that exist? Where do we now recognize that a threat to public health anywhere is a threat to public health everywhere is part of what this bill is focused on. It would also limit uh, patient costs for certain medications for chronic conditions, diabetes, asthma, heart conditions. We should arguably look at what is needed for long COVID uh, as part of this next iteration, uh, next generation of this bill. Bill also requires reimbursement being the diversity and cultural competency of the healthcare workers. We know workforce matters, right? As we talk about a maternal health bill today that now prioritizes midwives and doulas and lactation coaches, how do we now get the pipeline of diverse? I want a whole bunch of Dr. Clarks and to all the other doctors on this call. I need to see do black and brown doctors, doctors who know, um, uh, uh, who can treat you with some familiarity with gender, with your pronoun, your, your differences. And we don't see enough of that in healthcare. Uh, in order for us to hold ourselves accountable, to measure progress, and to identify areas of further improvement, we need to have clear, actionable data. I heard uh, Dr. Sprague talk about data uh, as I joined as well. The bill would require the use of standardized metrics related to health equity. Provider and payer organizations already collect and report on many metrics related to health equity. This standardizes the process to facilitate the collection, analysis, and reporting to inform our ongoing efforts. The third pillar is about prioritizing equity in state government. Um, you know, Jim Hunt, my predecessor to the league, has said, if you're not at the table, you're on the table, you're on the menu. Um, <laughs> and the reality is we're often not at the table. So our priorities are not usually reflected in government's priorities. And we are very fortunate to have leaders like um, Representative Dom. Uh, I just got off the call with um, um, uh, Representative Decker just a few minutes ago. We have phenomenal leaders in Massachusetts. So as we reflect on how Massachusetts isn't good at a lot of things, we got to think that it's not Alabama <laughs> and it's not Florida and it's not North Carolina. So we are very fortunate, but we are we, we lead from the front, Jackie. That means that we have to be thinking about long COVID in a way that no one else in the country is thinking about it. We have to be prioritizing these issues in a way that no one else. So data, 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 priority to prioritization of um, leaders in key positions within government. And finally, I want to emphasize that public is aligned with these priorities. The Compact Commission, a statewide poll through Mass Inc. Uh, polling group, and that data said that 96% of res residents agree that everyone should have the opportunity to live in a long, healthy life, regardless of their income, education. A vast majority, 80%, recognize that some groups face more obstacles to getting health care, and 83% believe that state policymakers should work to improve health equity. So, in summary, there's a bill. Um, that leads us to the bill. And Massachusetts, um, when you are trying to pass a bill, uh, as Jackie and others on this call know, you got to create the, the moral um, social imperative. So we did a report, uh, worked with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts to do a report, the foundation, $5.9 billion is the cost of inequity in Massachusetts. What would that, how would that be reflected if you now thought about the impacts of long COVID, which is still, the research is still not there yet. 
So the annual economic burden of health inequities experienced by populations of color in Massachusetts is 5.9 billion. This is a sticker shock when I tell you. It will be 11.2 billion. The annual economic burden of health inequities experienced by populations of color in Massachusetts will almost double by 2050. So I know in this conversation of long COVID, there's an urgency to it, but I would argue there's an urgency to all these other diseases I can talk about. And if you're black and you're brown, you could live, you can get on a train from Roxbury as, as Dr. Clark and others will talk about and live 23 years longer to Beacon Hill. That's unacceptable. And then you add that people are living sick, carrying the burden of sickness. We don't even talk about the, the impact it has on people's livelihood, on their, um, on their social lives, on their relationships, on all those other aspects of society, on their voting, on their participation in society. These are all the impacts. So I'd say this from a policy standpoint, uh, I need everyone on this call, as you think about long COVID, to also be plugged in on the Act to Advance Health Equity, House Bill 1250, Senate 799, uh, with phenomenal leadership, Senator Pavel Payano, Senator Liz Miranda, Representative Bud Williams, and Representative Judith Garcia. Uh, Representative Don, I am so appreciative of you and your leadership and your work, uh, and particularly in this space and all the other spaces you show up in and my good friend, uh, Dr. Madoff, um, and all the work that you do. Um, I hope that's helpful. Extremely helpful. Thank you so much. And everything that you said about being fortunate to have such leadership in Massachusetts, I feel for all the speakers um, on today's discussion, including our next speakers from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, who are going to share with us a little bit about government action and response. I'm thrilled they're both here. I want to welcome Dawn Fukuda and Larry Madoff. And I'm not sure how you want to juggle your presentation, so I'll leave that to you. Just know how grateful we are that you're with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tom and uh, Representative Decker and Senator Steer. We're really um, grateful to, to be here today. I'm going to lead off, and then I will um, hand it over to Dawn. So um, thanks again for having us. And uh, Michael, uh, nice, really nice to see you, and um, thank you for the, uh, for the for the shout out. Um, we've we've worked together uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, hope to be able to continue to work with you. And I share um, your thoughts about our good fortune for um, living in Massachusetts and having um, the kinds of colleagues that uh, that that we're uh, working with on this, on, even on this uh, meeting today. Uh, that uh, you know that so much um, of the leadership uh, happens here in Massachusetts, and I think um, I, I'll try to be uh, brief here because I know we're 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 getting uh, late into the uh, into the session. But I I, I can I have the next slide, um, and we're of course uh, starting out here, and I know this is this has been now um, well um, represented by uh, Dr. Clark and, and Dr. Martinez. And Dr. Martinez, I did not know until this uh, in, until today that you uh, had worked on on this uh, definitional report from NASM, which I think goes a long way um, to um, uh, to helping us um, understand COVID. I think we have we have suffered uh, from this lack of having a, a unified definition. And having this uh, having this definition from a national body like like the National Academies um, is going to go a long way. You know, you, you have to understand what you're seeing. You have to learn about what you're seeing um, before you can measure it, which I think is another key role for public health is our role in, in surveillance of, of this. Um, actually, all of the things that have been talked about in this call fall squarely uh, in the lap of public health. In many ways, and and so we are taking on a, a lot of this responsibility around um, research, around uh, surveillance, around education, and of course around prevention. Um, so long COVID, um, it, you know, it, it, in that very first bullet point, it's infection associated, and so preventing the infection in the first place is so important to what we do in public health. And so recognizing uh, the public health role in, in prevention is really key. We know that um, you know, most of us at this point have had COVID and uh, continue, uh, COVID continues to be with us. And we know that each repeated bout of COVID 
uh, increases the odds of, of long COVID. So, um, so the, our, our role in prevention is, is very important. Uh, it, it, in addition to my role in, in, in public health, I, I continue to see patients um, out at uh, UMass Medical Center and have seen patients certainly with acute COVID and, and, and with long COVID as well. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And we mentioned the, uh, the, the many organ systems that are involved and the, uh, the, the similarities, by the way, that this has to chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalomyelitis, uh, ME-CFS that has been seen with other infectious diseases, uh, this, this, this appears to be um, probably fall into that category. Um, and I will say that at the bottom of, uh, of, of this list here is what, what I think is probably the most um, common and consistent symptom that we see with, uh, with long COVID, which is fatigue. And uh, it, it can be difficult to sort out from many of the other conditions that are also associated with that. So having that definition from, from Mason, also having the report uh, that uh, Dr. Martinez alluded to on the um, sequelae, the uh, long-term effects uh, of, of, of COVID on the um, on on social security and other other systems is also important. And that other report from Mason that also came out is is is, is also quite important in understanding that. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to stop my comments there and uh, turn to the next slide, please. Uh, just, just one one other point um, that that I wanted to make before I, I turn this over to Don is that it is really important for public health authorities to measure the burden of long COVID. Um, like anything else in public health, we need to be able to measure it, be able to assess it um, in, in order to act effectively. And so the first step, which I think we've come a long way towards is making the uh, case definition from Mason, but recognizing that that is yet to be completely accepted and uh, so, so we're still working on having a standardized medical definition that, that people will all agree on. We need to have a way of, of classifying long COVID. It is not currently a reportable condition per se in Massachusetts. And so we need to do, develop methods, algorithms for understanding uh, what long COVID is and how much we're seeing of it. We recognize that it's, it, it appears to be very common and uh, trying to understand and, and be able to measure it is so important. Um, and also, uh, importantly, there's no lab uh, test that defines long COVID. And so um, you know, met much of our public health metrics comes from laboratory reporting. And in the absence of that, we need to develop other methodologies. And finally, um, the, the, the data that we obtain for this surveillance needs to be timely, and needs to cover a large representative population. And, and we at DPH are currently developing methods to do this, including mining the electronic health records that are present throughout the state. But we're very fortunate in Massachusetts to have our academic partners at uh, Recover and others that are, are working so hard on this problem. And the next slide, please. And with that, I'm gonna I'll turn it over to Don and thank you. Thanks, uh, Larry, Dr. Madoff. Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am John Cicino, and I'm currently the Director of the Bureau of Infectious Disease. And as, um, as Dr. Madoff described, uh, long COVID is not one diagnosis, um, but a varied set of symptoms, conditions, acute and chronic, potentially, but not necessarily disabling. Um, and any response to long COVID cannot be the responsibility of a single state or federal agency, a social service provider, or organization. Uh, our provider group. So we're going to require partners, all of us, um, and some of those are listed here, not all of them are listed here, uh, due to the variety of manifestations of long COVID and the variability in the magnitude of impact people experience, not to mention what others have already said, which is the interplay of socioeconomic, baseline health, environmental and psychosocial factors. Um, a range of partnerships are going to be required for an effective response uh, that meets the range of population and community needs. But this is not dissimilar to other complex uh, health issues. I am a 30-year old school HIV advocate, 
right? It's not that dissimilar to a response to HIV in some ways. Um, and there are lots of other examples out there that can help us to be, to be successful. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, um, so this is sort of a summary sum of the current activities uh, at EPA developed since COVID-19. Um, as Dr. Madoff mentioned, a lot of our efforts focus on risk mitigation and prevention, vaccination, also treatment. Um, but what, one of the most important responses to long COVID uh, is actually primary prevention. Um, so many of the activities here focus on that, uh, including access to personal protective equipment, PPE like masks, recommendations for isolation for people with COVID while they're infectious, uh, COVID vaccination, and timely treatment. Um, currently, this work is supported by dedicated COVID state and federal funds, as well as Medicaid, Mass Health, Medicare, private insurance providers, uh, and leverage a range of other um, CDC and FERSA and other federal funder uh, funding streams. Our, our efforts at EPH are also ongoing to optimize health insurance coverage for COVID services uh, and to preserve scarce public health resources for COVID response to reach uninsured and underinsured populations and to optimize health equity in the ways that we are obligated to do, um, especially since many of the dedicated federal resources that have been granted to states for COVID. Um, are likely to end in June 2026 unless some, some other action um, happens. And that's really important because we really need to understand the ways in which existing infrastructure uh, can be deployed to continue to support COVID uh, in ways that are both cost effective and cost efficient. Uh, next slide, please. So, while we don't know precisely how many individuals are living in Massachusetts with long COVID, and the reasons for that have been described here. Um, the national estimate is that there are about 17 million residents in the United States living with long COVID. And if you, if you account for the fact that Massachusetts represents about 3% of the U.S. population and apply that figure, that would mean that there's about 350,000 people living in the Commonwealth who may have or have had uh, long COVID. So this is an imperfect method. The numbers may actually be higher. Um, but it's, it's why the surveillance that many folks have, have described on this call is really, really critical. Um, the Kaiser Family Foundation has had some really excellent reports on long COVID that highlight disparate impacts for adults who identify as transgender and individuals living with disabilities, as well as individuals who identify as BIPOC, Black, Indigenous people of color. Um, and because the experience of COVID infection and long COVID may interfere with participation in things like employment, school, caregiving, volunteering, community engagement, and other speakers have alluded to that, um, there can be substantial uh, socioeconomic, social impacts of long COVID that may necessitate not only medical intervention, but really tailored social service interventions such as financial assistance, food services, protection, benefits counseling, rental assistance, and housing advocacy, and legal services. Um, and again, that, that is a, a much more vast system than we currently have for folks who may be impacted by long COVID. Um, and again, the specialized resource base for COVID response may be and likely will decline. Um, and I'm going to keep emphasizing that because so much of the response to COVID in Massachusetts has been supported by dedicated state and federal resources. And so it, to the extent that those may be at risk, um, our ability to do some of this in, in work uh, may also be uh, compromised. Next slide, please. Um, so in return, in preparing for this briefing, Dr. Madoff and I discussed the types of responses that, that may be most impactful. This is only a partial list. Some of this might be accomplished by DPH or by DPH as a, as a partner with others, and other activities here fall outside of governmental public health and rely on clinical, local public health, community-based, state-based, tribal and indigenous people-serving organizations, and other partners, including our state legislature and Congress. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so there are lots of models out there for how we might do some specialized uh, work for people impacted by long COVID. This is a diverse list with some wildly different approaches in terms of size, scope, funding level, complexity. Um, and perhaps there's a solution out there that may be a, a combination approach. I'm not going to read this list. These are just some examples. Um, but there are certainly models out there of how to do tailored public health, healthcare, psychosocial service response uh, that we can and should and are obligated uh, to draw from. And that is my last slide for the next slide. Wow, thank you. Um, I want to recognize that some people were having problems with the sound on that presentation, Dawn, but 
your slides were so amazing and the captioning was on. So I'm hopeful that people captured that. And I'm also grateful that in preparation for today, these slides were created because I also think that that um, gives us another insight into the purpose of these briefings really is to sort of help us sort of focus on these issues. I'm thrilled to reintroduce Jackie Lindsay to come back and tell us about vision and goals for the future moving forward as we as we close out this um, briefing and also get your guidance and your expertise and your caring for that. Jackie. Thank you. Um, there's more that I could say, but I know that our time is short, so I'm just going to keep it tight and communicate the headlines. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers because you can hear uh, the synergy of a lot of what people are saying. But I just want to say, in working with the the uh, Boston COVID Recovery Cohort, which is really a group of represent representatives from our hospital systems, equity leaders, but especially also our community, the mission is to center community and social justice to attain equi equity regarding long COVID. And the reason I'm mentioning that is what I'm about to talk about in terms of where we're heading is making centering community and advancing health equity real as we work to address long COVID. People wanna put COVID and long COVID in their rear view mirrors. BCRC wants to head in, a, in the opposite direction because we see the data that predicts that long COVID will grow. The good, there's good news on the horizon we have state and national leaders who are stepping up to advocate that we not only do more, but we do it better to address long COVID and advance health equity. We've got elected political leadership at the national le level, our own Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, and also Senator Bernie Sanders are urging their colleagues to understand that long COVID will continue to debilitate our families, children, communities, healthcare system, and our economy unless we do something about it. National leadership is also advocating for public, private, and community-based health systems to begin to work together instead of remaining in their historical silos. In our own state, you heard it from the horse's mouth. We have a new leadership group, the Health Equity Compact of more than 80 Black and Latinx leaders that's come together to advocate that Massachusetts make advancing health equity a priority for all. We've got all of that to build on. Yet, while state and national leadership to address long COVID and advance health equity have begun to advocate for policy change, we need much more patient and community-driven leadership, not just to support these other efforts for policy advocacy, but to help shape them. So where things are headed on that front is patient and community-driven advocacy groups around the country addressing long COVID are beginning to work together. Two, BCRC's next community education forum this fall will showcase the work these groups are doing to address ongoing COVID and address and, and advance health equity. And then three, and this is really important, BCRC has begun conversations with key members of these groups and our other partners to help plan and convene a national summit on long COVID and advancing health equity in 2025 that will convene key stakeholders at the state and national levels addressing long COVID and advancing health equity, like some of the ones that have been mentioned today at this briefing, but also especially to support these key stakeholders to learn from patients and communities as well as each other to define shared vision and priorities for change and a movement to address them. Because right now, Things are so incredibly siloed. So the invita in closing, the invitation to Massachusetts legislators is this. 
And as I say this, there's something that I do in the work with other groups going after systems change. It's important to identify what's important to do, what's possible to do, and what's ours to do. So here's what we invite Massachusetts legislators to do. Support the policy priorities we've advocated for, day at this, for today at this briefing. Join us in welcoming and hosting in the Commonwealth in 2025, a national summit on long COVID and health equity. And last but not least, model what it looks like to truly partner with, listen to and learn from and invest in our diverse communities, to be part of shared leadership in our state, to improve the health care and health of our communities, and to build systems for public good that better serve us all. And we can do it. Thank you so much, Jackie. And I love the invitation. I love the reminders. I'm so thankful to you and to each of the participants in today's briefing. Thank you to everybody who's joined us. As a reminder, just some housekeeping pieces. We'll be sending out the slides and links to today's presentation for everyone. We ask you to complete a brief survey so we know what else people need or want. And we want you to tell us what was useful and not useful about this about today's event. And we will share definitely with participants and panelists so that we all can grow and move forward. But really to the panelists, I just, my great gratitude and appreciation for your work, your commitment, your willingness to share that with the public and your advocacy, your fierce and powerful advocacy. Thank you. And thank you again, everybody for joining us. Look forward to our paths crossing soon. Thank you.